most gracious heavenly father i come before you today to give thanks and praise you are the ancient of days you are elohim adonai you are yahweh you are the great i am that i am jehovah shama jehovah gabor jehovah shalom jehovah parats the great breaker the one who opens the way as your servant as your ambassador I come before you to thank you for the influence and the increase that you've shown me for you are the rider on the horse whose name is faithful and true and you've been true to your word your word says acknowledge you in all our ways and you will guide our paths and so father I come before everybody publicly to acknowledge you you are the God of my covenant you are the God of this altar you're the God of my business you're the God of my family and I love you and I worship you and I adore you. And I thank you for the influence, increase in influence and prosperity that you bestowed upon to me. I thank you for dealing with the enemies of your altar. Not my altar, but your altar. You're gracious and your mercies endure forever. And I pray for each and every person that hears this album that they experience your power for your word says you do not give us a spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind father then i ask that and moving forward father i beseech you that anyone who hears this prayer that you allow me as your ambassador make this declaration and that you empower this declaration for those who have trouble sleeping at night for those who have sleep paralysis for those who have things touch them and implant them with viruses things that touch them and implant them with sickness in their sleep lord i pray for them now by the power of the blood of jesus christ i build a hedge of protection around them like that which surrounded job and i fortify that hedge as your king and your priest based on revelations 1 5 through 6 with the blood of jesus christ but most importantly lord i sign a war angel by their bedside an angel that will destroy, disrupt, confuse, and lay siege to the forces that plague them at night. Father, I ask that you, Father, I ask that you sign my declaration, not for my sake, no, not for my sake, but for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, show your power, show your strength, show your might. You are the Lord, mighty and strong in battle, and people in this field need to see you mighty and strong. Allow them to lay down and rest and that they sleep be sweet, Father. There are many people who haven't had a good night's sleep, for they are tormented. Allow those people to rest, Father. Allow them to sleep. Allow them to experience your joy and your peace and your love. Many of them don't even know you. Many of them have turned their back on you. Many of them are backslidden, Father, and that's fine because you love us and regardless, because you sit outside of time and space. I ask that you show forth. Arise, Father. Show your power and show your might. I ask these things by the blood of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the same power that raised him from the dead. Amen. Now, if you're new to the Dark Water channel, what I'm about to say to you may not make a whole bunch of sense to you. Because you ain't been around for all this. So I'm talking to the people who've been here for a minute. You guys are going to understand why I named this album Ric Flair. But for you new people, let me bring you up to speed. You see, from the time we came into the paranormal field, it's been a lot like WWE wrestling. You know, people attacking people, acting a fool, lying, backstabbing. Just doing the most crazy, wild, insane, foolish, stupid things that you could ever see in your life. And you know, last year we took a year off. We tried to build dog man cams, get evidence in the field, try and make something for the whole entire community, right? And we got some evidence. We really did. Had cameras in Florida, cameras in Virginia, cameras in Mississippi. Had all kind of stuff popping. 
but no people didn't like that they had to try and band up to try and destroy it take it upon themselves to do the community a favor and try and destroy things people stole from us and you know I'm sitting back thinking about the whole situation I said man you know this really is like WWE wrestling and if it's going to be like WWE wrestling if we're going to play by the rules that everybody else play by if we're going to do what everybody else do then I'm going to be Ric Flair and that's how this album became the Ric Flair album so what does that mean what does that mean for you as a listener no, it don't mean that I'm going to put out no fake content Because that's not how I roll It don't mean that I'm about to run around picking fights with people That's not what I do I only finish the fights that have started with me But what it means is From an entertainment standpoint I'm just going to drop it all I'm just going to keep hammering Over and over and over And over and over again Because we got the goods Unlike anybody else in this field We have the goods Welcome to the Ric Flair album. Ric Flair, Nature Boy Ric Flair, still the world heavyweight champion. But Rick, I'm sure this thing between you and Dusty Rhodes is certainly not over. Well, Bob, let me put it to you like this. You remember a couple of years ago, one of the biggest episodes of one of the biggest programs in the world was the night they shot J.R. Ewing. You remember that? Right. The whole world thought JR was dead. But you know what? He climbed right back up, drew the biggest house of all time, and to this day, he rules the ranch just like I rule the NWA. And honey, I'm not gonna take you home no matter what you say to me. The name is Ric Flair. is true yeah i know you said baby this is final and i blame myself all that's left of me now is an animal and i cry for help i wish my car's gonna reach you give it my all cause i need you all let it go let it go let it go till i get you Listen, I wasn't sure if I really, really wanted to share my encounter, especially since now I know that there are people who want to silence men and women who share truth. But I decided to trust in God, not to fear man. And so I'm telling it to you. I've been working as an explosive expert for over 20 years, specifically at rock quarries. For this job, I've traveled all over the world, excavating over 100 million tons of rock and ore. And I'm not tooting my own horn when I say this, but I'm considered to be one of the foremost experts in my profession. Now, these events happen when I decided to leave the company that I was working for and start working as an independent contractor. Now, let me pause right here for a moment and say a few things to you so you understand why I made this decision. You know, as a company man, you got to go where they ship you off to. And that was something that bothered me because there was times where they would ship me off to foreign countries for over a month. I, mean, I was away from home, away from my family, missed birthdays, missed anniversaries. I missed all kinds of special and important events in my family's life all over the dollar. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to take my knowledge, start my own company, and go out on my own. And that's what I did. The first job I took was in Colorado, deep in the woods. And on the first day, things were already strange. Normally, there are a number of people on the job site. However, when I arrived right before sunrise, not a truck on site. And I need you to understand, this is the type of job where you get to work early. And I just couldn't wrap my mind around this. Had I taken a contract with a company full of slackers, what the hell was going on? But I'm sitting there in a the truck and as soon as the light hits the sky, everyone pulls up at the same time, like it's orchestrated. Now the site manager was a guy named Drew. We shake hands, go inside the trailer, talk about what specifically he needs. From there, we head out and he introduces me to the guys. Then we do a walk around. Now, looking back on it, 
this should have been the first sign that something was wrong because we head over to this area where they wanted to expand walk up this path to the top of the wood line and everyone else is looking at Drew and I like we're crazy for standing on the side of this hill in the wood line we're there looking down on them and they're whispering to themselves with this panic look on their faces we talk about it and Drew tells the guy that we need to clear a few more trees from the wood line and nobody moves he looks at all of them again he says guys I need you to get to work let's get this over with and everyone reluctantly starts to move now pause right here in the story let me explain something to you there's some job sites that I go to where there's a crisis in leadership meaning the employees don't respect the leader now in my mind I'm feeling that that's what's going on Drew has this crew of guys and none of them have any respect for him that's what I was thinking but get this I stay on site the entire day and when we get close to sundown, it was like the workers were fleeing. Like they expected a snowstorm or a tornado or a hurricane to come at any moment. I've never seen anything like this. We're talking about big, tough guys. 6'5", 6'6", 6'7", 297 pounds, fast walking to their trucks and getting the hell out of there. Never, ever seen this type of coordinated movement on a job site in my life everybody's in their trucks and out of there in three minutes kaput gone however me and drew go to the work trailer and start talking we're there sitting down drinking coffee discussing plans and you start to hear this growling outside man i'm talking about loud growling so i'm saying to him drew yo listen what the hell is that and to my surprise drew is sitting there acting like he doesn't have ears like he doesn't hear the same crap that i'm hearing he keeps talking and ignores it. But I'm like, nope, we're going to stop right here in this conversation. Hold up, dude. Are you telling me you don't hear that growling? What is that? That's when he looks up from the paperwork on his desk and says, yes, I've been hearing it, but we have a job to do. The faster we do it, the faster it can get done and the faster we can leave. So it don't matter what it is. We got to get this job done. Listen, that growling goes on for a solid five minutes, then it stops. And I got to give Drew credit. This dude has balls of steel because he just kept looking over the logs, filling out his records for the day. Nothing seemed to bother him. 30 minutes later, he says, listen, we need to set those explosives in the morning. I'll meet you here at 6 a.m. And if there's anything you need, I'll help you with it. And then we leave. Fast forward a bit. It's 6 a.m. the next morning. Sun not up. I get there and he's outside standing next to his truck. As soon. And I mean, as soon as I get out of my truck, I hear what sounds like something running on the gravel. And I'm not talking about like a fox or a coyote. This is something running heavy on two legs across the gravel. And again, Drew is standing there completely and totally unfazed. Now stop right here for a moment. I want to share a little secret with you that I learned about Drew. Drew is fucking crazy, bro. He really, really is. Looking back on everything that happened, Drew is fucking crazy. Because we start walking in the direction of where I and I know he heard this running across the gravel. And all we have is a flashlight. That's when he breaks down everything. I mean, he says, look, he told me that this property butted up to the edge of some land that was owned by some Indians. Now, let me say this. Drew didn't talk exactly that nicely about the Indians. He went on to call them savages, worship false gods. I mean, he really spazzed out. But he goes on to explain to me that when the company acquired the land, he never really considered that there was a problem with it. He just figured it was some cheap land. Then he goes on to explain to me that a company prior to his company had come in, bought the same land, tried to work the land, tried to run explosives, and things went terribly bad for them, and they went bankrupt. Now, I need you to imagine the scene. We're walking along. He stops shines the flashlight on his face you know how you used to do when you were a kid at night playing with the flashlight you shine it in your face and make yourself look spooky well he stops lifts that light shines it in his own face and says listen there's something out here i know it i've seen it i've heard it but we have a job to do and my family needs to be fed and i need you to understand something me and this thing have a problem and only one of us is going to win and I'll be damned if I let whatever it is out here bankrupt me and my family. So we're going to just have to deal with this and get it over with. But it's going to come to a head one way or the other. 
Remember I told you earlier that Drew was crazy? You see, this was the moment where I really, really, really realized how crazy Drew was. Because the look of determination in his eyes went way further than just normal determination. Normal, I got something to do and I'm going to do it. This was a psychotic, psychopathic look in this man's eyes. He really meant everything he was saying. And as Drew is finishing that sentence, we hear that running on the gravel again, just to the right of us. And so he turns and walks in that direction with me lagging behind him. Understand, I'm doing contract labor. I'm not about to get out in front of him, chasing down whatever the hell he's chasing down. But I also realized right then and there in that moment that Drew was confronting whatever the hell it was moving around in this darkness. Now picture this, we're walking along and he's doing this kind of scanning back and forth with the flashlight. We're walking, he's going left and right 10 yards, then out 20 yards, then out 25 yards. We get around about 20 yards in front of us with that flashlight shining and you see what looks like two gigantic, and when I say gigantic, two freaking gigantic dog paws. And I'm talking about the size of my hand. He stops the light on those paws and then starts to shine it up and sure enough there is a giant black wolf standing right there looking at us now let me ask you a question have you ever found yourself in a situation where you felt too embarrassed to be a coward like you know you you know you should run you know you should flee but man I don't want to show this weakness in front of other men I'll show this weakness in front of my friends listen that's the kind of situation I was in, and I'm going to keep it 100% with you. I was embarrassed, but not embarrassed enough not to start backing away from whatever the hell that thing was. And as that flashlight moved up its body, initially I'm thinking to myself, yo, I got to be hallucinating. This cannot be real. But then you see this chest, and you see it breathing. You see the rib cage expanding with every breath. Now, I'm 10 yards behind Drew, and he starts to walk closer to it saying, listen, I don't know what the hell your problem is, but we got work to do, and I'm going to need you to leave. Now, pause right here and let me say something to you. If I was you sitting here listening to the story, I'd be like, yo, this is a load of hogwash. Like, who does that? But when I tell you this man was crazy, I need you to understand, Drew was really freaking crazy. And as this story goes on, you're going to realize that I'm not lying to you. Drew had mental issues because he walks up to this thing and it starts to walk back from him, looking at him like it's confused. We're talking about a wolf standing on two legs, a giant wolf head, sharp pointy ears. And I'm telling you, they didn't look real happy about moving back away from him. But this man showed absolutely no sign of fear whatsoever. But I stand there and watch as this thing drops back down on all fours and starts to walk away from him, looking back at him over his shoulder and growling. Really got me about this whole situation was when Drew turned his back and started walking away from it. I'm like, listen, man, are you crazy? Did you see that thing? What was that? He tells me he believes that that creature has been assigned to protect this area. But it's going to have to learn and it's going to have to understand that there's new ownership in this area. And I'm going to teach it a lesson one way or the other. So the two of us head back into the trailer. He puts a pot of coffee on, we sitting around talking, and I'm trying to express to Drew my concerns with what I just saw, and he goes on to explain to me, he says, listen man, you're getting paid a lot of money to do this job, but I need you to understand something. My entire company, my entire family's livelihood depends on this getting done, so I'm going to get it done with or without you. I would love for you to continue to work here and help me get it done. But if you can't stick around, that's fine. Go ahead and leave. Essentially, what Drew did was pull my card. Basically telling me to stop acting like a little girl and get the job done. Sunrise comes around. We head out, set the explosives, and I make things go boom. Just like I'm paid to do. 
And boy, let me tell you something. When I made everything in that area go boom, the growling started. This time, it didn't sound like one of them growling. This time, it sounded like five, six, or seven of those things growling in the woods about 50 to 75 yards away from where we were. And I realize that you may be saying to yourself, well, that could have been any animal growling. But let me explain something to you. When that type of explosion goes off, all animals, and I mean everything, birds, crickets, bees, everything is shaking and they start to flee. These growls were coming in our direction. When you looked at the man's faces on the job site, they were physically shaken up by what was going on. Everyone except for Drew. He looks at those men and says, gentlemen, you're getting paid to do a job. Let's get to work and get the job done. So they proceed to going back to work while these things growl from those woods for the next 15 minutes. Listen to me, I worked that job for the next three months. Every morning, Drew and I were the first two people there. And every night, we were the last two people there taking care of business. Listen, the fourth and final month of my contract comes around. We're in that trailer alone. It's 6.45 p.m. The sun is going down. And for the first time, I see him with a shotgun. And this time, Drew was scared. And I mean scared out of his mind. He goes on to tell me this story about how early that morning, he got there around 4 a.m. as opposed to 6 a.m. And as soon as he got out of the truck, those things surrounded him on every side forced him to get back into the truck and ran him off i'm sitting there with a cup of coffee in my hand and i asked drew well man what do you plan to do about this that's when drew goes on to share with me that he hired a security team and that this particular security team started tonight now pause right here one more moment and let me explain something to you when we talk about security team drew wasn't talking about like a guy with a fake police officer uniform with a flashlight he goes on to tell me that he's spending a half a million dollars on this security team and that they're going to be there tonight and he wants me to stick around with him while they are there. Now I'm sitting there saying to myself, this don't sound right. I'm ready to get out of here. But I'm looking at Drew and he's really scared. And he's a cool guy. So I said, you know what, Drew? I'm going to stick around here with you. It's going to be all good. So the two of us stick around until midnight. And I know and I've heard what people say about Dogman that there's this type of Dogman that's invincible and can't be stopped. But let me tell you what I heard and what I saw. I heard these guys shooting and it wasn't semi-automatic fire. I heard explosions and these weren't explosions that I set the charges for. About 2.45 a.m. they called us outside of the trailer and they have these giant black bags. And I'm not talking about like a plastic garbage bag i mean he's huge 14 15 foot long giant black bags that look like something from a moor covered in blood fur and hair and they're dragging it to their vans and early when i told you this wasn't no mall cop security type guys these guys all look like special forces they had night vision full tactical vests some of the most intimidating men i'd ever seen in my life and i work in a profession full of intimidating men they load five of those gigantic black bags into their van and roll out. So now get this, after that night I was there for another couple of weeks and there was nothing. I mean not a sound on that job site. I finished my contract, got my money, went on to the next job and Drew and his company finished what they started and luckily for him he didn't go bankrupt. Every now and then Drew and I hook up, have a drink or two, hang out and you know what? It seems like ever since he took care of that little issue, his life has gotten better. I mean, extremely better. His company is growing. Things are going the right way. I don't understand because I've been told that when somebody crosses Dogman or encounters Dogman, they have bad luck. But in his case, it seems like things have gone better for him. Now, Dusty Rhodes, as I said in Atlanta the other day, some of the glitter might be brushed off the edges. But all you've done, big boy, 
is put a little fuel on the fire. You ask around. You ask around anywhere. When you get Ric Flair riled up, whoo, you better be a hell of a man. Now you made the mistake of trying to insult me, my friend, and Dusty Rhodes, as I've said before, we've only just begun, you understand? Learn to love it, learn to live with it. Diamonds are forever, and so is Ric Flair. Woo! The world champion, Nature Boy Ric Flair. Ever since I was a child, I can remember seeing my guardian angel. The first time I saw him, I was 11 years old. My friends and I were playing, jumping off the roof into the pool. You know those above ground blue swimming pools? Well, we had been jumping from the roof of the garage into the pool. Listen, I had done this like five times already. And I remember running, jumping, and coming to the realization that I wasn't going to make it into the water. I don't know if it was because my legs were tired or I took a wrong step. I'm still not sure to this day. But let me tell you what I'm 100% completely sure of. I was flying through the air and I knew I was going to be short. Looking down at the ground saying to myself, okay, I'm about to break something. When I saw this angel, no, he didn't have wings. He just looked like a man. Touch me under my foot, gently push my foot straight up into the air. My trajectory changes and I splash down in the pool. The next time I saw him, it was my senior year in high school. We had just finished the game between our crosstown rivalry. And every year after this game, there's this huge bonfire and there's this strip where everybody goes racing cars. This night, I had been drinking and decided that I was going to race my truck. Listen, I bet $250 against one of the kids from the other school that I could beat him. And I remember climbing into the front seat of my car, cranking it up and looking over in the passenger seat and there he was my guardian angel now pause for a moment some of you may be saying well guardian angels have wings no let me tell you what my guardian angel looked like now he looked like an older version of me no older than 28 29 30 years old he was muscular and strong looking but he wasn't super big or buff he's sitting right there in the passenger seat looking at me like you know better than to do this but i had made up in my mind i am going to race for this money Understand the truck is cranked up. We're ready to race. People are all around. And when I go to hit the gas, the truck just shuts off. Again, let me paint the picture for you. I'm in the right lane. He's in the left lane. There's a girl in between us with a rag in her hand, twirling it all around in the air. The headlights are on. The crowd is cheering. Everybody's excited. I hit the gas to take off. He takes off flying. And guess what? My truck goes nowhere. And I get this 10 minutes later. Another two guys go to racing. The guy who was in my lane races off. A deer comes out of the woods, crosses the road. He hits that deer, swerves down into a ditch, hits a tree, and goes through the windshield. Grand opening and grand closing for that party. Police, ambulance, kids getting arrested for drinking underage. It was just totally ridiculous, and it was one hell of a night. Now, if that wasn't traumatic enough, the next time I saw my guardian angel was way worse this is when i went hiking on eagle rock loop in arkansas i'm 25 years old coming out of a bad relationship and i just wanted to get away take a trip be by myself go to a place where nobody would be i get to the location my decision is to hike five miles in and five miles back understand that trail is 26 miles long i had no intention of going any further than five miles i'm about four miles in trapped inside my head thinking about this breakup i just went through and about life and how i'm not where i want to be when I realized that it's quiet, way too freaking quiet in the woods for my taste. And that's when I see what looks like a big black dude walk across the trail up ahead of me. And I don't say that to be offensive. I just figured it was a tall black dude with like a furry coat on out for a hike and he crossed the trail because he was walking on two legs. At that moment in time, it didn't register me as a threat. So I just keep walking. But listen to this. I get right to about the area where I saw him and I get this feeling that I need to stop. And I'm like, nah, you're being paranoid. Just keep going. We're going to get to the five miles. I take another 10 steps. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I remember it clear as day. And I knew without a doubt in that moment what was going on. My guardian angel was there with his hand on my chest holding me back because I felt a force physically stopping me from moving. However, what he did next was unlike anything I've ever encountered. And I pause right here for a moment in the story. Let me explain a little bit more to you. I know without a doubt that this was my guardian angel and I'll tell you how I know because I turn around to go in the opposite direction because I'm afraid, frankly. And when I turn and take a few steps, I hear what sounds like someone took a boulder and threw it through a bunch of tree limbs. Turning, looking back over my shoulder, it's what everyone describes as a dog man, except for this thing is blackish gray, and it has this head of what looks like a freaking hyena. It's suspended in midair, arms spread wide, claws pointed in my direction, and I see my guardian angel standing there holding this thing by the neck suspended in midair. And this look of concern comes across his face and I know deep down inside, I need to run and put some distance between it and me. And so that's what I do. I take off running down that trail as fast as I can. And as I run away, I hear what sounds like World War II going on. Tree limbs snapping, trees falling over, some of the most frightful growling noises I've ever heard. Imagine for a moment, you're running through the woods all alone and you know what you just experienced, what you just saw was 100% real. There's no hallucination. You can smell it. You can feel it. That's what was going on with me. I ran for a solid 400 yards until I was out of breath. I remember the fatigue setting in, breathing heavy, bending over at the waist, saying to myself, there's no way I'm going to be able to run all the way back to my vehicle. Taking a deep breath, standing back up and starting to run again. This goes on for another 100 yards and then I feel that pressure on my chest. The same pressure I felt on my chest before that thing jumped out of the trees, I felt it again. But this time I felt this peace and I knew I didn't have to run anymore. I just felt like whatever it was, whatever happened, it was over. And it was right there in that moment that all the panic, all the adrenaline, everything drained out of me and I felt refreshed. I stopped breathing heavy, stopped sweating. I mean, it was almost as if nothing happened. And I know if you listen to the story, you're saying to myself, this makes no sense. This guy's laughing. Some people may say, I don't believe in angels. Some people may say it was an alien. Listen, all I can tell you is this. This is what happened to me. I wasn't afraid. And so I walked the rest of the way back to my vehicle, got in and went home. If you're not carrying the big gold, you're second best no matter what you tell yourself. So gear up, ladies and gentlemen. Get used to it in Ric Flair, who you're looking at the man. <laughs> 